I'm going to tell you about a uh, topological approach to nuclei. Now, it's uh, not quite Kelvin's knotted vortex tubes in ether as atoms, but actually it's in a similar spirit. It'll be winding solitons in a pion field to describe nuclei. So it's sort of in, in that kind of spirit. And if I get to the end of the talk, then you'll have found out what I'm doing this week. But it's not important that we get to that point. I think that uh, most of the audience are unfamiliar with this topic. So it'd be much more in important, I think, if I give you some information, if you get something out of half a talk, than nothing out of a full talk. So please just now interrupt if anything's not clear, or if you don't understand something, or if you'd like me to say it in a different way. It doesn't matter how far we get, as long as somebody gets something out of it. So that's the idea. So what I'll do is give you an introduction to the to different ways that people might study nuclear and how this sort of fits in with them. And I'll tell you how good this model is um, or how bad it is, depending on your perspective and what we can try and do to improve it when we find things that don't work. I'm not going to give you any references because handily, Nick Manton has written a book that's out this year on the topic that I'm going to tell you about. So if you want to know more about this, almost everything I'll tell you about you can find in this book that's just appeared. So if you are a, want to study nuclei, what could you do? Well, if you're a particle physicist, you'd say, oh, we have this great standard model. That fits just about every experiment we know about. And the bit of the standard model that deals with nuclear physics, nuclei, the strong force is quantum chromodynamics. So let's just study it from that point of view. Let's use quantum chromodynamics. That's the fundamental theory of the strong force, QCD. And nucleons, so protons and neutrons, are made out of three quarks. So why don't we just study, say, helium by see seeing what happens when you have more quarks? So the problem is that this is a great theory. It has very few parameters, basically a coupling constant and a couple of masses for your quarks. But you can't calculate anything with it at that level. It's just about at the level that people can calculate for one nucleon, so one proton or one neutron. But there's no hope at the moment to be able to say anything about multiple nucleons. So you can't say anything about helium. That's way beyond what anybody can do. So it's a great fundamental theory, but completely useless for nuclear physics. Now, lots of people make their living doing nuclear physics, so they must be doing something. So what are they doing if they're not doing that? So a typical sort of approach in nuclear physics is you completely ignore the fundamental thing. You say, let's treat nucleons as point particles. We'll write down some complicated forces between these point particles. It'll have lots of parameters in it. So the model tends to usually have about 50 parameters, something like that. There's loads of experimental data, so we can fit all these 50 parameters and then calculate any anything we'd like to do. So the models have lots of parameters. There are also lots of models. There's lots of competing models, and people use different models for different aspects of nuclear physics that they want to study and so on. So you can see there's sort of two quite extremes. One involves lots of phenomenology and parameter fitting. One is very fundamental, and you can calculate things accurately. One is fundamental, but you can't calculate anything. There looks like a bit of a gap there, also on the transparency, so that, on the slide. So that means there must be something I can put in the middle. That's what I'm going to tell you about. So the thing that goes in the middle is called the SCIRM model. So how does it fit in the middle? Well, it's a low energy approximation from QCD. So that was done by Witten in the 80s. So you say, I'm going to do some approximations to make the theory simple enough that I can do something with. Now, what people have been doing since the 80s, so including me, I started on this in 1989, so just in the 80s, 
So I have done other things in between. Don't worry that I've been doing the same thing for all that time. But what we've been doing is trying to figure out, is this a good approximation? Is it a reasonable approximation that you've made to get this model? And if not, how can you improve it? That's the story that I want to tell you about. So I said that, so Witten did that in the 80s, but the model's called the Skirm model. So Skirm must have done this before, and he did, he did that in the 60s. So that was before QCD. So he came up with the model before people knew about QCD, so completely independently of that. And it was only later that people realized that it had a connection. But what he got was his sort of fundamental uh, thing that he brought into that was to say, actually, the things that I'm going to describe are going to be soliton type solutions. So they're going to have some topology and they're going to describe nucleons. So it seems like a sort of radical thing to do if from the point of view of, of QCD here, you say, I'm interested in studying nucleons, nuclei, so protons and neutrons. What is this low energy approximation? You say, I'm just going to deal with, because it's low energy, the lightest degrees of freedom. So what are the lightest particles that we see in there? And they're not protons and neutrons. The lightest particles are not made from three quarks, which are protons and neutrons, they're baryons. They're made from quark-antiquark pairs. They're called mesons. And the lightest of those is called a pion. So these pions have masses that are an order of magnitude lower than the nucleons. So you say, I'm going to just deal with pions. They're the lightest thing. So the approximation starts off by saying, what's the lightest object particles that I see? Let's just work with those. That's quite radical. You say, I want to study nucleons. The first thing I'm going to do is throw them away. I'm not going to have any nucleons in my thing. So what Skirm realized was that actually you try to throw them away and you write down just the lowest degrees of freedom, but they come back. But they come back in a different form. They come back as soliton solutions, so topological objects in this lower, simpler effective theory. So we'll see how, how that goes. As I said, you now want to know, is it effective or not? And it's taken lots of you know, decades for people to calculate things, to even act, to even test, is it reasonable or unreasonable? Because it's a simpler theory, but it's still not that simple. So that's the idea. You want to test some of these things either against experimental data or against results from standard approaches in nuclear physics, which are essentially equivalent, because their models are so good. OK, so that's the sort of background. So I need to tell you what this skirm theory is. From here, I've only drawn one of the pions. So the pions are made from quark antiquark pairs. We're only interested in standard matter. We don't want a strange matter or anything like that. So we only have two flavors of quarks up and down. So with up and down, if you want a quark and antiquark, you can make three different combinations. So there are three pions. So our theory is going to be a field theory of three fields, one describing each of the pions. And here's what it looks like. So it's a field theory, so I have a field. So what is my field? Well, it's an SU2 matrix. Why two? Because I told you I'm only interested in two flavors of quarks, just up and down. So the basic field is an SU2 field defined throughout space. That's what it means to be a field. And it could, could depend on time as well. If I was talking about dynamical things, for most of today, I'll just talk about static things. So we'll just think of an SU2 matrix defined at every point in space. I told you there were three pions. How do these three pions appear? Well, I can parameterize an SU2 matrix, as I've done there, with its entries. And you see there are three of them called pi, pi1, pi2, pi3. They're the three pion fields. Then there's something called sigma, but that's not an independent field because it has to be an SU2 matrix, so the determinant is 1. That means that the sigma squared plus the sum of the pi squared is 1, so sigma is not an independent field. It's just there to, to impose the constraint. So we have these three pion fields, a triplet of pion fields. If you like, you can think of just the pion fields as being a vector. So everywhere in space, there's a vector of these three pion fields pointing somewhere. But its length could go to zero, that's fine. Length could go to zero just means that sigma is either plus or minus one. So there's a boundary condition which says now if you go very far away, if I don't, if I've got some pions or something over here, I go very far away, there are no pions, so all the pi's go to zero. 
that means that sigma either has to be plus or minus one at spatial infinity. And it has to be the same value as spatial infinity, otherwise I'll have energy up there. So I'll just make the choice to say sigma is one. So in other words, if I go very far away, my boundary condition is my skirm field is the identity matrix. Are we happy so far that we're just going to be dealing with an SU2 matrix in three dimensional space? If you go very far away, the matrix is the identity matrix. Good. So even if you didn't like physics, that seems like a, an interesting problem to study. And you can now see why there's topology in here. That's because just of what this field is. So I said it was a map from R3 to SU2. But I said this boundary condition is that all points at infinity, are, are, the field is the identity matrix. So that's compactified spatial infinity. So that means topologically, rather than R3, I can think of space as being S3, just by this one point compactification. So I really think of my skirm field as being a map from S3 to SU2, but SU2 is basically S3 anyway. So my skirm field is a map from S3 to S3. And such maps are classified by an integer. So the third homotopy group of S3 is the integers. That's just saying that if I cover my whole space, all of space once, I'm going to be winding around this three sphere target space, SU2. How many times do I wind around it? So it's just a winding number. So every field you give me that satisfies the boundary condition and is smooth will have a winding number. That winding number. I'm going to call B. The reason is that it's topological, so it's conserved. Doesn't change if I do time evolution. And what's the conserved quantity in the physics is baryon number. So you identify this topological conserved quantity with baryon number. Baryon number just gives you the number of nucleons. So if you want to study helium, for example, you'd say, well, I'm interested in the B equals four, the charge four, because helium ha has four nucleons in it. If you want to write, if you have to actually calculate, you give me a field, a skirm field, and you want to calculate what the topological charge is, you just do that integral that I've given you there. That's just the Jacobian. I've sort of written it in a funny way uh, that maybe you're not so familiar with. So I'm using Einstein's summation convention. So I have three R's, R1, R2, R3. Just think of those as derivatives. So I could differentiate with respect to X, Y, or Z. I've got three of them. I'm multiplying the right hand side by U inverse because that gives me something nice in the out Lie algebra. That gives me something that's a right invariant form. So think of R as just being like the derivative. Um, and so that's how you calculate it. And I said that that's the number of nucleons. That's the baryon number. So what about the density? What's the physical meaning of the density? Well, if I'm saying now I've got four objects somewhere. That density, where that density is large, is telling me where those objects are. It's telling me about the distribution of the matter. I've got no, four particles or something. Where that's large is where the matter is and how it's distributed. So it gives you sort of an, an intrinsic shape for the nucleon. So I haven't given you any uh, energy function yet. So if you're going to uh, work on this, you'd say, well, I want to know, now what does it look like? I'm going to have to minimize some energy within the topological charge that I'm interested in. So here's what the energy looks like. So I'll remind you that the killing form on the, the algebra is minus trace of something. So in other words, if I take something in the algebra like an R and square it, if I take minus trace, that's the thing that's non-negative. So you might be worried that it says sort of minus trace and is that negative, but that's the thing that you want to make sure you've got something that's greater than or equal to zero. So the first term in the energy, R squared, so that's quadratic in derivatives. That's just the Dirichlet energy. So something that's quadratic in derivatives. So if you were a differential geometry, you'd say that's the harmonic map energy, for example, the first term. Then there's a second term, so that's got four R's in it because it's got a commutator of a pair of R's. So that's something that's quartic in derivatives. Then there's an optional term that I'll, I'll mention in a minute. We'll leave that out for most of the time, but uh, you notice in the first two terms, I have no parameters whatsoever. That's because I can use scaling. I can choose energy and length units to scale whatever coefficients I would have put in front of the first two terms. So 
there's some choice of energy and length units, but once you've done that, that's all the parameters that you have in this model. You just choose energy and length units, which is, you know, I've scaled them out here, but that's all there is. Now, there's this fi final term, which has an M in it. So M is the physical pion mass. So there's some number from experiment that you would input into there. I said these pions are very light compared to the neutrons. In fact, they're so light that a reasonable approximation for most of the time is to pretend that their mass is zero. So a lot of the theory is done with setting M equal to zero in this, and that would correspond to massless pions. Or you could set M equal to the value that comes from experiment. In these units, it's about a half or something. But it's a choice and it won't make much difference whether M is zero or M is about a half in what I tell you. So for most of it, I'll do M equals zero. Then at some point, I'll tell you when the difference is if you put an M non-zero into here. So that's the problem, all right? You can you could come in and you could wake up now. Anybody sleep? Wake up now, and you could start at this point. You could say, "I'm going to give you that energy functional. What do its minima look like in each topological sector? So give me a B, like one or four or something. Minimize that energy in the B equals four sector or B equals one sector. What does the solution look like?" And that should tell you something about what that nucleon looks like, what that nuclei looks like. One thing is that you might notice about this, because I mentioned that the, I'm using sort of right invariant forms, is that there's a symmetry. I could take the skirm field that I have, the U, and I can conjugate it by any constant SU2 matrix that doesn't change the baryon density and it doesn't change the energy density. So that's the symmetry of the theory, and it just corresponds to rotating this pion vector. I could rotate this pion vector around, and it doesn't change anything. Similarly, uh, I could, I've, I've got spatial rotations here, so I could rotate in space, or I could do this rotation in the pion field, which is called an ISO rotation, and nothing will change in terms of energy and baryon density. So I said you, you're trying to look for the minimum energy in some sector, there's a nice helpful bound. The proof is so easy, I could even stick it on one line here. You can show that the energy in the units I'm using, that the energy is bounded from below by 12 pi squared times the number of nucleons you have. So here's the proof. If I take, remember minus trace is something that's non negative. So if I take this quantity here, it's the square of something. So that's greater than or equal to zero. Well, let's just expand it out. I get an R squared, which is the first term in my energy. I get something that involves that's fourth order in R. That's the other term in the energy. And the cross term has three R's in it. And that's exactly the expression for the baryon density. So if you multiply that out and just integrate it, you find that that's the proof of that the energy has to be 12 pi squared. It has to be greater than 12 pi squared. In fact, you can show you can't attain the 12 pi squared exactly, be exactly. To do that, the map would have to be an isometry. And R3 is not isometric to S3, so there's no way you can attain that, that bound, except for the completely boring case of if I take U to be constant, the identity matrix, not, I've not got any baryons, I've not got any energy, B is zero and then I attain it, but for anything non-trivial, you can't attain it. Right, so let's look at the simplest case of B equals one. What does the minimum energy in the charge one sector look like? Well, it's called a hedgehog, it's called a hedgehog because what does the pion field look like? So I've put my soliton at the origin. The pion field just points straight out everywhere, this vector of pions, like the spines of a hedgehog. Although you try finding a picture of a hedgehog where the spines point directly out, it, it, they don't. All right. it's, a, it's a mathematical hedgehog. All right. this, is, this is as close as I could find. So they're pointing directly out, and all you need to know is once you put that assumption in, uh, that's basically radial symmetry, is what's the length of the pion fields as you move away from the center of the soliton out towards infinity? And that's what that function f is doing. It's a function of the radius, and it's just telling you how quickly do you go from being at the center of the soliton to going out. So you could take that and that's there and stick it in the energy. That will give you some 
uh, an integrator of the angular variables so that gives you some uh, energy to minimize for this function f of r with the boundary conditions that f has to go to zero if you go far away that's saying you go to the identity matrix and it has to be pi at the origin because that's where you attain the field being minus the identity matrix you have to attain all possible SG2 matrices at least once because you're winding once. So right at the center of the soliton is where you get as far away as possible from the vacuum. The vacuum was the identity matrix, far away as possible is the antipodal point, which is minus the identity matrix. So the baryon density, if you look at that, as you see that field is not spherically symmetric because it's you know, pion fields point in different directions depending on which way you're going out. But the baryon density and the energy density is spherically symmetric. That's because I had told you I had these two symmetries. I could rotate and I could also iso rotate. So I could rotate space and I could rotate the pion fields. They're both symmetries of the theory. So although that field depends on space, if I do a rotation, I can undo that with an iso rotation. A rotation in space is equivalent. I can undo it by rotating my pion field. So it's not really symmetric, it's equivariant, but the energy density and the baryon density can't tell the difference. So if I plot you a surface of constant baryon or energy density, it would just be a ball. The energy density is largest at the center and it just decays to zero as you move away from the center. So if I pick some level set for the baryon density to ask where the matter is, you just see a ball. So a single nucleon just looks like a ball. But that's hiding a bit. It's hiding the fact that these pion fields are pointing in different directions. And so sometimes we want to show that by coloring in the ball like a juggling ball here. Well, I've colored in this surface of constant baryon density by color showing you which of the pion fields is the largest in that particular at that particular point and whether it's positive or negative. So the three pion fields, which one has largest magnitude, whether it's positive or negative, that's six different colors. And so you can color it in and using this juggling ball scheme. That's useful as sometimes probably won't be so relevant today. But if you want to know about interactions between a couple of these balls, if I don't color it in, you'll just see two balls and you'll think, well, it doesn't really matter. I could rotate one and it's not going to change its interaction with another. But if you color them in, you see it is changing. So for example, if I have two balls and I want to make them attract, the best thing to do is rotate so that the same colors are facing each other. Because that, that's then got the lowest energy because then the field doesn't have to vary much between them and things like that. Sorry, can I ask a quick question? Yes. The, I'm, I'm wondering the boundary lines between these colored regions, they seem wiggly, not regular. How is, why is that? Is, that's because I have I've computed this numerically on a grid, and then I decide to tell it which color to plot by just projecting, asking it which is the largest one, and the grid is rectangular, and spheres don't quite fit in grids. So... That's just a plotting. You weren't supposed to notice that. I do have a better plot, but I was too lazy to put it on where I've done a better interpolation algorithm for my plotting. But OK, good. So if you do that and you calculate what is the energy of this, I told you it had to be more than 12 phi squared. You get it's about 23% above that bound. That number will be, well, the fact that it's quite high above the bound will be useful. It will be interesting in a minute. Um, any other questions before I, we ask what happens for B bigger than one? Yes. I'm just still wondering why it uh, localizes like that. I mean, maps with topology, like the first thing they always say is, oh, where's the topology? Well, spread out everywhere. Good. So, so that's because of this quadratic term, the second term here, because you can do a scaling argument and they scale differently in three space dimensions. So the Dirichlet energy will scale one way and the quadratic term will, the quartic term, sorry, will scale the other way. And that look forces a size scale that localizes it. Good. Anything else? I can't answer the Martian question. It's not in a language I understand, but. But but good question. I'll, we'll discuss it later. Uh, so 
so I did have a movie, but I didn't trust putting my Mac with Teams on it. So I converted it into a PDF. So what you can do, I said most of this was static, but there's a dynamical version of the theory. You just extend it to a Lagrangian that's a relativistically invariant version of that energy, and you can do dynamics. So you could set off with uh, two charge ones by putting them together but with a little bit of a distance between them. That's what the top row is. So you start off with a couple of charge ones, and you can see that they see each other because they're not perfectly spherical. They're sort of squashed a bit. They can see each other. And then you evolve that, and they attract. That's good because you could have just gone home. All right? If they if they if can't make them attract, that's not going to be a great model of nuclei if there's no bound states. So if they would have repelled, then that was end of story. They do attract each other, and they then make this thing that looks like a torus. And then they scatter. So they were coming in along the x-axis and they go out along the y-axis. Uh, the two walls again. That's because it's just dynamics, it's conserving energy and so on. If you do the same simulation but put in some dissipation so that they eventually they lose energy, they will eventually settle at that, don't, at that torus. Um, so you can... That's the minimal energy configuration at charge two. It looks like that torus there. So it's an axisymmetric configuration. You might think you get one big ball or two balls that sit next to each other or something like that, but you don't. You get that toroidal configuration. So the next row down is what happens if you put three objects together. They come together here. Yeah, again, they're tracked and they'll pass through what looks like a tetrahedrally symmetric configuration. That should surprise you if you've not seen this picture before. If I give you three objects and say, arrange them in tetrahedral symmetry, you'll be there a while because it's not possible. But you can see these three objects, because they deform, emerge, and don't keep their individual identities, they're able to create something with tetrahedral symmetry. That then, oh, this is all dynamics, so they then scatter through and they produce three objects a charge three again, but it's not three individual ones this time as they've scattered, they've gone into a charge two and a charge one. And you see that the charge two is the torus thing and the charge one is the, is the ball. And then if you put four objects together, you can see these four objects, they coalesce. And again, at the minimal energy configuration, they have cubic symmetry this time. Again, four is not the right number to associate with symmetries of a cube. And they then scatter out, in this case, on the dual of the original tetrahedron. So from doing simulations like this, what we found is what the, all the minimal energy configurations look like, up to about 20 or something. Um, and so that's just the numerical results. So here's up to about eight. And now I've colored them in with wiggly lines between the colors that you're not going to look at. Um, right, and, and so here's what you see. I've shown you the first four. So the first one, charge one, is spherically symmetric. Charge two, we've seen, was actually symmetric. The minimal energy charge three is tetrahedral symmetry. Minimal charge four is cubic, has cubic symmetry. You go, you see, now seven looks interesting. Seven has icosahedral symmetry, it looks like a dodecahedron, and so on. So there are now two things to do once we got these results. One is understand this mathematically. Why are these symmetries appearing? for these charges. And then the second thing is the physics. Do these have anything to do with nuclei with that number of nucleons? So I'll do the maths bit first. How can you understand that you can get the, that the minimal energy charge force should, be, should have cubic symmetry or the seven should have dodecahedral symmetry, for example? So here's how we were able to explain it. I'm going to give you the hedgehog ansatz again but in a different coordinate system. So I'm going to use a spherical polar coordinates. But, so I've got radius, but instead of theta and phi for my coordinates on the sphere, I'm going to use the Riemann sphere coordinate. So a complex coordinate that you get by stereographic projection. So it's a complex number, including infinity. So if I do that, so my coordinates in space are now R and Z, then if I just rewrite this, Hedgehog ansatz, that's the exact same thing I showed you before, but I've written it in terms of W is just Z. So I've just rewritten it here. 
And what you see is that now the hedgehog ANZAX corresponds to W equals Z. How could we generalize this ANZATS? Well, an obvious generalization is to not take W equals Z, but let's take W to be some rational map. So ra ratio of polynomials in Z that don't have any common roots, and the highest degree is B. So the highest degree on either the top or the bottom is B. So that's just a rational map between Riemann spheres. Why is that interesting to do? Well, first of all, that gives you a very easy way of, of producing maps, skirm fields that have degree B. If my, my F of R has, is, has the same boundary conditions as before, if you do that, the skirm field has degree B. So it's kind of a generalization of the hedgehog ansatz, which was just W equals Z, to now let's put higher degree polynomials in. Another interesting thing about this is if you then calculate, so this is an approximation here, we're not getting an exact solution, but if you calculate what's the energy of this, you find it, uh, it only depends on which rational map you put in through one coefficient. So the one coefficient here, I've written down what the energy is after you sort of integrate over the angular variables. The one coefficient that distinguishes between the two, any rational maps is I, and it's that integral expression there. So it's some integral of the rational map over its, its target space, right? So it's some um, energy function on the space of rational maps, if you like. So what he says is within this approximation, which rational map should you choose? You should choose the rational map that minimizes that energy function I. So rational maps, now they're just ratios of polynomials, so they're a finite number of coefficients. You can search through them all and find which one has that as the minimum energy. And here's the answer. So for B equals one, the degree one rational map is Z, and it's unique except for I can do spatial rotations and ISO rotations, which correspond to rotations of the domain and the codomain of this rational map. If you do the two, you find that the minimal I minimizing rational map is Z squared. That has axial symmetry. If you do it for three, you find that that's the minimal energy rational map. It's not obvious, but that map has tetrahedral symmetry. What do I mean by tetrahedral symmetry? I mean, if I rotate my domain by one of the elements of the tetrahedral group, I can undo that by rotating the codomain. It's not necessarily the same rotation like it was for Z, but there's a rotation. In the same way that Z squared is actually symmetric because I do rotation in space, I can undo that by rotation in isospace. I can rotate the rational map, but the angle is doubled because it's Z squared. And similarly, the cubic map. Yeah. That's what you find as a minimum of charge four, and it has cubic symmetry, and there's a little bit of representation theory you can do that you can prove, for example, if I want to map with cubic symmetry, the lowest possible charge you can have is four, and that's the unique map. So you can sort of explain why you get those symmetries and why they appear at the charges that they appear at. So I haven't given it here, for example, but you can ask, when is it? What's the lowest charge at which you can have an icosahedrally symmetric uh, map and it's degree seven and it's unique. And if you then use it, you find that it looks like uh, the charge seven that I showed you. So these pictures are constructed not from the numerical solutions that I showed you before, but by just using that ansatz I gave you with the appropriate rational map and you can't tell the difference in the picture. It's an approximation and the error tends to be about sort of 2%. So it will match to the numerical results with an accuracy of about 2%. You can also determine other things as well. Let's say that you see that these surfaces have holes in them. The holes correspond to the ramification points of the rational map and all interesting things like that. But basically the upshot is we have a very good understanding of the mathematics of these solutions and why they appear and why they have their symmetries. Now to the physics, where the story ain't so great, unfortunately. So now you'd ask, what do these have to do with nuclei? So the first thing you might ask about is energies. You could say, I know what the energies are of the ground states of you know, um, hydrogen and helium and so on. And uh, that, that's what the blue data is, so normalized, so that uh, I, I'm taking out the units. 
The blue data is the energy per nucleon up to uh, nucleon number eight. So what you see is it's, it's incredibly flat. Nuclei are bound, but they're very weakly bound. Binding energies tend to be about 1%. So I said, oh, it was great. Our solitons were bound and they came together. The problem is they're too tightly bound. The binding energies here are about 10%. So they're an order of magnitude too big. So these are the kind of things I said, no, it's taken decades to calculate these things and figure out, oh, it doesn't work. They're too tightly bound. You could also ask sort of what do the various symmetries and this localization of the matter tell you about things? How do they compare with nuclei? Well, it turns out now that there are quantum numbers here. I said you could rotate and you could add isorotate. And when you quantize those motions, you get quantum numbers of spin and isospin. And various symmetries restrict what quantum numbers you can have. And things work very well for the first four charges. So, for example, charge four, helium, having cubic symmetry tells you that the only allowed spin states, you can have spin zero, and then the next spin is spin four. So you can't have spin two, one, two, or three, for example. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the energy states of helium, then you find the ground state is spin zero, and the next excited state is spin four. So it works very well, up to charge four. Then it all goes wrong. Seven, for example, is far too symmetric. That has loads of symmetry, and it tells you that the lowest energy spin state you can have is spin seven halves. That doesn't, that doesn't match with nature, where the ground state has spin three halves. So it's too symmetric. So it works for the first four, but then goes wrong. And you can also kind of see, uh, just from the pictures, that it's going to go wrong. Because then you know from nuclear physics that once you get above charge four, so four is, is uh, it's helium, and that's very tightly bound compared to everything else. So beyond charge four, you tend to form clusters where one of the clusters is trying to is trying to look like helium, and then other things are added in. So, for example, at charge five, it's known that what you really get is a halo nuclei, which should look like helium plus an orbiting neutron. So you should look like sort of a four plus one. So the picture for five should look like something like a four and a one, and it doesn't. Similarly for charge uh, seven there, that dodecahedron should look like a four and a three. So you'd be looking for something that looked maybe like a sort of a cube with a tetrahedron near it or something. And beryllium eight is known to look like so two helium close to each other. So it should look sort of like two cubes next to each other, not like that. So you see there's a problem here, both from the point of views of energy and from what the shapes are looking like. The energy problem starts quite early. The shape problem starts beyond charge four. So I said, when you come up with a problem, then you should try and think, well, OK, we had an approximation. Clearly, the approximation is not good enough. What can we do to improve it? So in order to go in that direction, let me tell you about an interesting way to think of the SCIRM model. So it's to think, it's to take an idea from string theory that's popular at the moment called holography, is you think of your theory as a different description in one higher dimensional space. How can we think of this theory in three dimensional space in terms of a theory in four dimensional space? So we want to use another kind of, uh, of theory called Yang-Mills theory, and that also has some soliton solutions called instantons. So what we're doing here is we're thinking now in four dimensional space, What's the field here? So it's a gauge potential, but it's a non-abelian gauge theory. So it's a gauge potential for SU2 theory. So the AI, the I is a capital I, indicating it runs over four space dimensions now. So one, two, three, four. Before lowercase I just went one, two, three. And it's an element of the Lie algebra. So it's two by two, each A. So you've got an A, one, two, three, four. Each of them is a two by two matrix that's trace-free and anti-emission. And F is the field strength given given there. So it's just a general, if you're familiar with electromagnetism, it's just a non-abelian version of that. And you can write down your energy function, and it's just F squared. There's also some topology in this. It's very similar to what I told you about before, the SCIRM model. It's in four dimensions. If you're familiar, if you're uh, if you're like 
uh, vector bundles, for example, the topology is the fact that this vector bundle has a second churn number. So it's an integer associated with it. That n is the expression for it. If you don't like that kind of language, another way to see why would this theory have an integer associated with it is that if I go very far away in space, off to infinity, I'm in four space dimensions, so infinity is going to a three sphere. To have finite energy, I have to have no field strength of infinity. So that means my gauge potential has to be zero or a gauge transformation of it. So it means at infinity, I have a gauge transformation. Uh, in SU2, that's SU2 valued. I'm on a three sphere. So my gauge transformation at infinity is a map from a three sphere to a three sphere. And we've seen that already has an integer. That's another way to think of what this integer is. So it's very similar. I've given the proof again there. There's an energy bound. So these instantons and other kind of solitons also have energy that's 12 pi squared times and bounded below by 12 pi squared times the number of solitons you put in. So this is a slightly different theory. Here you can attain that. In fact, there's a whole moduli space of solutions that attain it. So the one instanton has energy 12 pi squared. And the two instanton, there's lots of them had energy 24 pi squared and so on. So it looks sort of a bit like the SCIRM model that I showed you in one high dimension, except you can attain all these bounds. What does that mean? It means there's no binding energy in this model because the two instanton are exactly the same energy as, the one, as two one instantons. So they won't attract or repel. You can just put them together and they'll have the same energy in one move. So how on earth is this connected with the thing I've showed you about already? It's quite simple. Right? You choose a gauge, there's a gauge there, so I can always choose a gauge in which the component in the extra space dimension is zero. I then write down an ansatz for the other remaining gauge potential components. And the ansatz is very simple. I say, I'm going to specify what the, what the uh, dependence on the fourth dimension is. It's just given by that tanch function. Uh, what about the dependence on the other three dimensions, I'm going to say that that's just this uh, current, this right invariant form of some skirm field. So there's an ansatz. It involves a specific function of the fourth dimension and then some something that involves a skirm field in three dimensions. You could take that ansatz, you can plug it into the expression for n, and you find n is exactly the same expression. You integrate over the fourth coordinate, N is exactly the same expression that you had for B now in terms of R. So if you take this ansatz, you find that N is equal to B. So the in number of instantons is the same as the number of baryons that you put in your skirm field. You can also find, stick it into the energy, and you find the energy is exactly the same as that skirm energy. So this now gives an interpretation, right? You can just think, and you see it's a little bit simpler here. There's only one term here in my ansatz, there's only one term in my energy. And the interpretation is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to build an instanton out of this skirm field, but you're not quite doing a good job because the instanton would have had energy 12 pi squared, it attains this bound. The skirm field has energy sort of 23% above this bound. This 23% is a measure of the failure of that ansatz to, to describe an instanton. Because if it perfectly described an instanton, the energy would be 12 pi squared, and it doesn't. So it's sort of like 23% bad, that ansatz. That then suggests a way that you could improve this. Right? You could improve it by getting a new SCIR model by trying to make that configuration closer to an instanton. And here's what I did to make it closer. This is again inspired by these ideas of holography. You add an X term. You say that this first, this term that I wrote down to give me the SCIR model was just the first term in an approximation. Let me improve the approximation. So I'm going to add an X term. I'm specifying exactly the dependence on X4. It's just the derivative of that tangent function. And now I need to specify what's the dependence on the other three coordinates. So these rows here, again, there's three of them. So they've got an index i, and they take values in the Lie algebra of SU2. 
So I've gone from just having a skirm field, an SU2 field, to all these extra fields. I've gone from three to 12 components. What on earth are all these, you say? Well, if you think back, what did I do? I said, let me just include the lowest energy particles. They're the things I told you were called pions. What do these describe physically? They describe the next lightest particles. They're called romesons. These are exactly the fields to describe romesons. There's the right number, they have the right symmetries, they have the right properties. So what this is doing is this approximation that you got so mathematically by just thinking about some high dimensional theory. It's physically allowing you to go to the next step in the approximation, including the next lightest particles in your theory. Now, I showed you that it actually looks neater from the high dimensional than when you go down to actually what does it look like in three dimensions? So you can do the same here. What does this look like now if I forget how I got it? Just integrate over the fourth dimension and produce myself a modified skirm theory. Close your eyes now if you're squeamish. That's what the new energy looks like. Right. So you can see we had the first two terms are the terms we had before, but now we've got these extra fields, these rows, and there's lots of them and they're matrices and so on. And all these terms, there's some terms that just have rows in them, and there's some terms that have rows and R's in them. So it's coupling these row mesons to the pions in all complicated kinds of ways. But notice there are no new parameters in this model. All these coefficients are fixed, right? So I've extended the model, but not any new parameters. I still only have my energy and length units, as I had before. Nothing new. So people had written down terms like this before. People knew that terms like this are the kind of terms that you should add if you want to include the next lightest particles, if you want to include romosomes. But because it's so horrendous and there's so many possible terms, these are all the terms that you know you could add by symmetry, people had just sort of picked one of them, for example, said, let's pick one term, one of these terms, I'll add it in, I don't know what its coefficient should be, that I'll have a new parameter, and let me see what the skirmions look like, what these solitons look like as I vary that parameter. And usually it didn't make very much difference and then things go wrong if you choose the parameter outside some range. So what this has done has, has generated for you a model where it's got the right structure to describe these X particles, but no new free parameters. So it's predicted for you what all these parameters should be. So it's horrible in the sense that that's what it looks like, it's nice in the sense that I don't have any new parameters. So providing I can go and have the stamina to compute what the solutions look like in this model, I could just see what's happened and what's happened to the energy. So remember, this was an attempt to try and get the energies closer because the problem is that 23% leaves lots of room for large binding energies. If your single soliton has an energy 23% above, that means lower charge solitons can have energies much less than 23% above and then have large binding energies. So the aim of this is to try and make the binding energies go down by making the one soliton have an energy closer to the bound. Or what you find is the one soliton now has an energy that's only 6% above the bound rather than 20 odd percent. So that's good. That means right, we've now put a limit on the binding energy can't be more than 6% now because you can't get below the bound. And if you look like the solutions, it looks like the top row. Right? So basically the solutions haven't changed very much at all. They look just the same. All that's happened is all the energies have gone down. Now here comes the miracle. That model was an attempt to, to pull the energies down. And it didn't, didn't do anything apart from that. But I told you that there was this one parameter, this extra term I could add that goes from pions to being mass plus to massive, so there's some term m squared or something, and people generally leave it out because it doesn't do much. In the skirm model, if you put it in or don't put it in, these pictures don't change. But in this model, because you've lowered all the energies, you've flattened out the energy landscape quite a lot. And that means that any small perturbation you now do has a much bigger effect than it had before. And in particular, this perturbation where you put m to be a half, roughly a half, or it comes from experiments, well, the pi or mass instead of zero dramatically changes what the solutions look like and they look like the second row. So what you see is it didn't change anything up to charge four, which is when it worked. Now that what the solutions five looks like a four and a one. 
exactly what you wanted from the cluster structure of large nuclei. You, uh, you wanted four to look like uh, helium with an orbiting neutron, and it does. Eight looks like two cubes sat next to each other. Looks like a, 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 that, um, that beryllium eight is made of uh, two helium sat next to each other and so on. And the structure is exactly the structure you expect for clustering for light nuclei. If you ask what does the energy look like, that's what we're trying to improve. It's now the black line instead of the red line. So it's not there yet, but it's significantly closer to the experimental data than it was before. And what it's suggesting is that if you now want to, it's you, you before you were doing just a SCIR model, you were doing the first term in an approximation. You add in the next term, it changes things to make the structures look right and it gets the energies much closer. What you should do now is add in the next lightest mesons and it will converge towards something that hopefully is uh, closer. Yes. So can I just check, you're adding in the pion mass, are you also including the rho mass? Yes, so the rho mass comes in automatically as one of those terms. One of those terms, uh, horrendous terms, there are so many it was hard to spot, but one of them is the rho mass, yeah. Anything else? Yes. So um, in your transition to Young Mills instance, you chose a, a parameter phi or a function phi. Yes. Yeah. Hange of something uh, of the fourth coordinate, which is, I guess, the time. Um, well, it's Euclidean time, so yes, yeah. yeah. So, so what it, what motivates that, or what? Yeah. So you can ask if I go back to that to, to that ansatz there. You can ask. Suppose I just put any arbitrary function of x four into there. What function would minimize the energy? And the answer is that tangent function. So if somebody if somebody gives you an R. So there's two things here, right? There's a dependence on the fourth dimension and there's a dependence on the other three dimensions. You could ask, irrespective of what the dependence is on the other three dimensions, what function should you put there to minimize the energy in the fourth dimension? And you can easily derive this, that function. There's some boundary conditions that it has to satisfy. It has to go from minus one to one to make sure that the instanton number is the same as the baryon number. So once you fix that boundary condition, the tangent is a unique function. Thanks. OK, so what two minutes, so I won't bore you with what I'm working on this week, but it's basically it's trying to improve the fact that here you go from having three to 12 fields. That took me a lot more supercomputing time to calculate things when you go from three to 12 and it sort of limits how high you can go baryon number. What I'm trying to do at the moment is an effective theory where you effectively build these terms up as effective interactions from the skirm field itself. So there's some uh, some way of doing that, and it leads you to some model that looks equally horrendous, but there's now no rows. There's just skirm fields in here. So the same number of types of terms, but you've effectively replaced them by to, you've effectively written row in terms of sigma. That's what, uh, uh, and that sort of looks like it's promising. So in the last minute, so what have I done? I've told you how it might be possible description of nuclei in terms of solitons. You definitely have problems with the original SCIRM model that people have worked on since SCIRM did it in the 60s, but mainly since Witten showed how to get it in the 80s. But uh, and you can improve it a lot by adding, going to this next level approximation. Uh, there's still a lot to be studied in this extended model. I've only done it up to baryon number eight. I uh, haven't told you anything about quantization, but there's a set program that you can do for that. And why might you want to do all this when nuclei, nuclear physicists can calculate everything? Well, first of all, it's you're getting it from some fundamental theory. There's not so there's not all this phenomenology and parameter fitting, but it also allows you to extend, if you can make it work now, you can extend it to new matter under extreme conditions. So you could start talking about matter in neutron stars and so on. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks.